Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Gary Merck, and I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Engineering. My focus is in undergraduate and graduate education. And I'd like to add my welcome to all of you for attending this event tonight. Uh, it really is an important event, and, and uh, I applaud the Diversity Committee for pulling together the, uh, the event and, and the workshops tomorrow, particularly Matt Frank and Kristen Constant, and, and, the, and truly the rest of the Diversity Committee. It's really an important event. It's truly important uh, for those of us in the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, to reach out and try to uh, generate a, a diverse group of, of students in our programs. Uh, the current situation in the United States is such that we have a, a dearth of, of qualified people in those fields, and, and we can't afford to miss out on any students that have the capability, and, and we really need to reach out to these students, and I think what we'll hear a little bit about today and, and on in tomorrow will really help us to understand some of the things we might be able to do to uh, fill that need of, of additional uh, students studying in the STEM fields. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our diversity workshop keynote speaker. Dr. Isaiah Warner is the Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives and the Philip W. West Professor of Analytical and Environmental Chemistry at Louisiana State University. He is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor and is a recipient of the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring from President Bill Clinton. One of his many accomplishments is the development of a successful STEM mentoring program that includes faculty, postdoctoral students, graduate students, and undergraduate students. He calls this program the Mentoring Ladder, and he is here tonight to provide his insights into successful recruiting and mentoring strategies, particularly for underrepresented graduate and undergraduate students. Dr. Warner. Thank you. Best laid plan of mice and men. I think it's okay now. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to be here. Someone asked me when was the last time I was here, or had I been here before? And I'm trying to recollect it's been at least 20 years, I, I believe, because I don't think I was at LSU, and I've been at LSU 19 years. Before that, I was at Emory, so I suspect it was during that time that I visited here. So things have changed a lot. Um, this is a topic that I'm always excited about talking about, but you'll find out I'm always excited about talking about my research also if you come to my talk tomorrow. But uh, in particular, I'm interested in students. I'm interested in students with uh, non-traditional background uh, performing well in the STEM area because I came from a non-traditional background. I'm from a little town called Bunky, Louisiana. And if you know anything about Louisiana, you don't know anything about Bunky. <laughs> because Bunky, <laughs> Bunky is a population 5,000, about 30 miles south of Alexandria. And when I was growing up, I thought it was absolutely atrocious that I had to go 75 miles away to Southern University to college, when why couldn't there be a college in Bunky? That's how naive and country I was. And I say that the Cotton fields were my mentors because I used to work in the cotton fields and every day I'd come home I'd tell my grandmother, I'm not doing this the rest of my life. <laughs> and if you know anything about the heat in Louisiana in July and August, you'll know why I said that. I mean, it's just unbearable to be out there. And right now when I go out in the heat in July and August, I wonder how, how did I bear this? How, did I, how could I have worked out in this heat? Anyway. And to get on with today's topic, uh, the title of my talk is Diversity Models at Work, The Mentoring Ladder. And this all came about because I had a colleague, uh, her name was Sandra McGuire, she has a PhD in chemical education. I was teaching a class and I would send these students over to Sandra and they were failing my class. So she was head of the Center for Academic Success, which is a, a center that focuses on trying to help students learn better. If you ever get a chance to invite someone else for a diversity talk, you should really invite Sandra over because she knows how to make, how to encourage and, and help students to learn. Anyway, I sent her a D or an F student and she sent me back an A or a B student. 
And it happened so many times that I said, something is going on that I don't know about. So I went and sat down and I talked with her. Turns out she and I were in undergrad school together. She was two or three years behind me, but we did go to school together at Southern University. And I said, what are you doing? I mean, what are you doing that I'm not doing? She told me what she was doing. I said, Sandra, it can't be that simple. She said, it is that simple for many students. And so what I decided to do was uh, check with President Bush to see if I could clone Sandra, and he said, no, that's not allowed. <laughs> so if I couldn't clone Sandra, maybe I could teach the students the techniques that she was teaching them, and then have these students go out and teach other students. And that's basically how I conceived of this mentoring ladder, and you'll see as I go along. And these are my co-authors, and one of which is uh, Sandra McGuire, right here, on this particular paper. And in fact, we've published a paper on this, and I'll give you the reference in a little while. But when it comes to, now, I was indicating this name, that if you guys don't know this name, you should know this name. Dr. James W. Mitchell, who was Vice Chancellor, or Vice President, I'm sorry, of Bell Laboratories for many years, a very distinguished scientist. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and he's also now Dean of Engineering at Howard University. He says Bell Labs folded, he's gone to Howard. This is one of your distinguished graduates. Jim got his PhD from here in the uh, 60s, late 60s. And this was the time when Iowa State was well known in chemistry for its recruitment and production of African American PhDs in chemistry. In fact, outside of Howard University, this was the number one place for African Americans to come and get PhDs in chemistry. Some of you may know that already. But Jim Mitchell loaned me this slide. And basically, what the slide uh, depicts is the fact that if you want to get minority young people out and get them on to get a PhD, there are a number of inputs and outputs. And in particular, the outputs, the losses you have to fight. Well, input, obviously, it has to be some home, some input at home, primary schooling, all of the normal inputs for any student. But there's a leakage in this pipeline. While you're putting these things in, it's draining out because of inadequate parenting and teaching, inadequate math skills and competition. And obviously, that's a natural selection. Not everyone can be a scientist, or we would have lots of scientists. Now, again, this is a slide I borrowed from Jim. If you look at minority youth and look at comparison of majority, by the 10th grade, only 10% of minorities are interested in science and engineering, whereas 20% are majority. Now, that's not bad, a factor of two. The problem is, as you go on, when you get to the PhD level, less than 0.1% compared to 0.3%. So that factor grows. And that's where the problem comes in, where these problems uh, with going beyond the science for students who are not taking the right courses. I, I know so many counselors who tell students, you don't want to take that course, it's too hard. You know, and those are the people that are doing detriment, detrimental things to our uh, students. Well, so what I came up with this hierarchy model which was designed to help students survive in the STEM area. And I integrated research, education, and peer mentoring. And so the first application of this program was to the Howard Hughes program. I was nominated by my dean to be a Howard Hughes professor, which is not the same as a Howard Hughes investigator. Howard Hughes investigators get a million dollars a year to do their research. Howard Hughes professors get about $200,000 a year primarily toward educational uh, research. But you have to also be a distinguished researcher in your own right, in your field, before you can be eligible for a Howard Hughes professorship. And here's a reference where we publish in the journal Science, Education, and Technology. The title of the paper was Hierarchy Mentoring, Hierarchical Mentoring, Transformative Strategy for Improving Diversity and Retention 
in undergraduate STEM disciplines. So that was published just this year, if you're interested in reading that paper. But uh, what we're doing is focusing on development in this mentoring ladder. And this model, basically, you want the students to learn the fundamental tools needed to excel in, in STEM. You want them to engage in undergraduate research because there's a study done in Michigan that shows that students who are involved in research tend to jump as much as a letter grade higher. And in particular, minority students make the greatest leap just by getting involved in research. And, oops, it's going to, this must be operating on autom automatic mode. So our students assign peer mentors and mentees in their field of study. They participate in community service, and they receive academic advising and monitoring from program staff. Now, where are these students? Here are these LSU HHMI undergraduate scholars. We call them mentors. And they're the students we're going to teach these skills to. And they're actually going to be involved in teaching these skills to their mentor. So it looks like a complicated ladder. It's not at all complicated. You just start out by this. And what happened was we started out teaching these students how to, how to uh, learn and all of these skills. There was this young man in mathematics who was having a tremendous problem. So there was another young lady who was doing very well in the class, and he asked her to tutor him. As he began to learn our strategies, he began to exceed her in grades. And she came to him, what are you doing that I'm not doing? And he told her, and he started tutoring her on the skills that we had taught him. And so though that is how it basically works. Students are anxious to teach other students how they're learning these strategies. And so you can teach their, they can teach their peers. We've involved community colleges. Uh, we've involved school teachers. And we've involved uh, faculty and graduate students. And so all of these are interactive sort of thing. Now, if we remember those of us that have graduate degrees, at least in my case, the way I reinforced my chemistry was when I had the TA. There was no way I could teach chemistry without knowing chemistry. So that's basically the strategy behind this. The students reinforce what they learn in these metacognitive skills by teaching other students. And they reinforce their metacognitive skills by applying it in research. And that's the whole strategy, and, and it works. And I'll show you in a minute how we know it works. So we have two programs. I started the HHMI. The HHMI program was designed for students who were, after their freshman year, failing in STEM. Now, you go back and look at their records. They have the aptitude for STEM, but they're not doing well. They only have a 2.5 to 3.0 average. And those are the students I would focus on. And we had some degree of success. And that's where I decided, well, what if I go back and get them before they even get into high school? And the way I did that was there's a program. How many of you know about the Meyerhoff program, University of Maryland, Baltimore County? A number of you do. That is the most distinguished program in the country in terms of African-American students uh, in the STEM area. And so I went to NSF and I said, the Meyerhoff program is not a model program. And they looked at me as if I had said something sacrilegious. What do you mean it's not a model program? I said, nothing is a model until it's been duplicated. And if you give me the money to duplicate it, I can show you that it, it, it could be a model program. And sure enough, I was able to write a proposal and convince them to do that. And the first proposal funded, uh, uh, we had about 50 or 60 students. We got a renewal where we now have about 90 students we're supporting. That funding is going away. Now we have to try to sustain the program. So this is the result of the NSF funding. The students have to have a 3.5 grade point average, have to high, have a high uh, SAT score, or ACT score, and then we give them these strategies. They interact with these students. When these students that are doing poorly rise up and get to this point, they can transfer into that program. When students in this program tend to not do as well, 
As long as they're doing all of, they have to do 70% of the things that we ask them to do. As long as they're doing those things, we won't, won't kick them out of the program. But if they drop, then they have the option of going to this program. This is a fully, full scholarship. This is only tuition. This is worth about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars a year. This is worth about three to five thousand dollars a year. And so, what we're doing is we have an interactive program, and the elements of this program are geared toward success, improved study, and note-taking skill. <coughs> and. We know that many students who come out of high school really don't know how to study. Their idea of studying is they come home and mom and dad say, go to your room and study. And we know that in college, it has to be interactive. You need to study with other people. And what students don't know, that they benefit by studying with someone who knows less than they do. Quite often, they'll try to study with someone who knows more than they do. But you need both. You need someone who knows more than you do, someone who knows less than you do. Because by explaining to the person who knows less than you do, you, you reinforce your own knowledge. And so study and note-taking skills is one element. Another element is metacognitive skills, learning how to learn. Many students don't know how to learn. They don't know even what kind of learners they are. Some students only learn by demonstration. Okay, other students only learn by doing it. And so all of those elements, have to, you have to know those. Development of group interaction skills. Improved time management skills. Many students are accustomed to only studying two to three hours a week. And when you tell them they have to study four hours a day, how can I find time to do those kinds of things? And so you have to show them time management, in fact, they have more than enough time. Enhance science comprehension through research. Development of mentoring skills. We have a summer bridge program. The first summer that students are in the program was this HHMI, or STEM. These students have to go through our rigorous training where they go through bonding. This is particularly helpful for students who are just coming into the program. Because those students now have friends when they come in in the fall as freshmen. They now have people that they know who are in similar or even the same major in some cases. These students are also placed in the same dormitory. So they interact because we learn later on that when we put them in the same dormitory, they interact very well and in fact the grades started rising in the group when we put them in the same dormitory. So what, we're do, what are we doing in HHMI and STEM? If you look at that group of students, a very diverse group of students. Again, there is a professor by the name of Sylvia Hurtado who wrote the, uh, who helped write the brief for the Michigan case which favored diversity. She's now at UCLA. But she's shown that if you are in a diverse environment, you learn better than students that are not in a diverse environment. Now why is that? And she makes lots of sense on this. Because if you are around someone who thinks differently than you do, in order to make your arguments, you have to reinforce your knowledge, right? Let's say uh, you're a Democrat and as a Republican, right? hate to bring politics into this, but let's just use that as an example. If a Republican believes one way and a Democrat believes the other way, and they start communicating, the person who has the strongest argument is going to win. Now, in having those arguments, you learn to defend your arguments, right? In having those discussions. So by diversity, we mean not only diversity in terms of politics, we're talking about diversity in terms of culture, diversity in terms of religion, uh, d uh, ethnicity, all of the kinds of diversities you can blend into a single mixture makes a better, better learning environment. And that's what Sylvia's research has shown. And you can look up a lot of her research and uh, it's undeniable what she's seen. So 
The way we spell academic success is through a three-prone approach, as I mentioned earlier, mentoring, education, and research. Let's talk about mentoring. When I talk about mentoring, I am not just talking about teaching, because many people think mentoring is simply teaching. Mentoring is more than teaching. Mentoring involves counseling. It involves intervening. It involves sponsoring students. You have to take the same active interest in a student that you're mentoring, or whomever you're mentoring. It doesn't have to be a student-teacher relationship. It could be a teacher. It could be a student mentoring a teacher. I'm, I have my kids mentor me all the time on computers. You know, so it can uh, be turned around. And so you have to take that same kind of interest as you would in your own kids. I take the same pride. When some of my students go out and accomplish things, I have that same pride as I do in my own kids. Uh, uh, my middle son, who got his college degree, and one day he was doing some student teaching before he found a job, finally opened up his own company. But before he found a job, he was doing some student teaching. He said, I cannot figure out what this thing is that dad gets out of mentoring. You know, what is this thing he keeps talking about? So he's in the classroom teaching a cl class, and he can't get this concept over again. And it's go over to the students. And so finally, he figures out a way to teach the students a little differently. Then all of a sudden, one student got in, two students got in, three students got in. He starts getting all excited. Then he said, oh, Dad, now I understand. Because he got excited, too. It's just this excitement of helping someone to learn. And so education, and when we're talking about education as uh, with everything else, we need to give them what they need for education. They need refined problem-solving skills for the STEM area. They need time management and organization, I mentioned. Enhance instant interdisciplinary learning. Ability to make connections between coursework and real world. That's the research part, the metacognitive skills, and writing skills. Yes, even STEM students need writing skills. Yeah. Some, did I hear an amen? <laughs> and uh, so when we're talking about education, we have a course also that we teach all of these things. Get, here's some of the topics that we teach. Getting on course to success. Self-awareness, are you on course? Mentor and review of midterm studies. Study strategies, is 24 hours enough? And we actually have guest lecturers come in. To, this class is a class for our STEM and HHMI students. They get no college credit for that, but they're required to take this class. And we have guest lecturers that come in and uh, give these uh, various the experts in, the, in each of these areas. Research. Our students are involved in research within the second semester they're in the program. The first semester they receive ex extensive preparation. They have a research mentor to offer guidance and support, and they have an opportunity to participate in summer research programs starting out all over the country. Now our students are going all over the world. Some of our students were in France this summer working uh, uh, with some French researchers, and we're expanding that effort. Now, if we look at the success, remember the HHMI students, the students who were failing in STEM. If you have a 2.5 GPA after your freshman year, you're not going to survive in STEM for very long, right? Because the classes get tougher and tougher. Here's what happened with our students. If we look at all of our students, 60% of them remain in the STEM area. This is for HHMI. And minority students are, are close. They're 52%. And if we look at LSU non-participating undergraduates, they're comparable comparable to nationwide statistics. Our statistics are much better. And these are students that we grab and say, we're going to save you. And we were able to save them not only and make them, and make them perform better 
than the national average. Now let's look at the LSTEM data. 90%, over 90% of our students uh, remain in the STEM discipline. Minorities are close, like 86%. And here's the same data for LSU and non-matriculating undergraduates. Oh, this is the HHMI. This is comparing to the HHMI program. And these are the data for non-matriculating undergraduates and nationwide. Clearly, we're doing something special here. And if we look at this data, well, here's the community college component, which was introduced in 2007 into the HHMI program. And there's a high school component also now. We have a summer bridge program for high school students where we work with them on the ACT. And also uh, our high school students have a LEAP test that the pass in order to get out of high school. We're working with them on their LEAP test also. Here's the data for the LSTEM program. Today we've had 195 scholars, 65 of them have graduated. We have 93% STEM graduation retention rate. That's that chart I showed you, which is amazing. Almost half of these students have at least a 3.7 or better GPA in a STEM field. And 89% are pursuing PhDs. Now this is where we think in the long term we're going to beat the Meyerhoff. The Meyerhoff program is producing mostly MD PhDs. We're producing PhDs who are going to come out and be professors and role models. We have a number of students, about three or four at MIT. We have a couple at uh, Georgia Tech, a couple at Michigan, some at Florida. They're all over the country. Our first PhD, first two PhDs, a uh, young woman who finished her PhD in mathematics at Rice. Then there's a Vietnamese young lady at uh, Wake Forest. She just finished her PhD in biochemistry. That young lady at Wake Forest was one of the first students in the program. And she used to tell me all the time, Dr. Warner, you're wasting your time. I'm going to medical school. I am not going to get a PhD. And guess who the first person she called when she got her PhD? And she keeps saying she's going to medical school, but I think she's forgotten about medical school. Phenomenal young lady. Uh, they are winning awards all over campus in addition to being leaders. Out of that group, we've had three Goldwaters, so Harry S. Truman Scholar. We've had two Morris K. Udall scholars on campus, that's for environmental work, and both of them came from our, from our program. First two ever on this campus, on LSU's campus. They're winning graduate fellowships, Tiger 12 honorees, the most outstanding uh, 12 students in the class that have made significant contribution to the university. And so there are lots of accolades that these students are getting. I wanted to talk to you about one other thing. And that is the transformation of the chemistry program at LSU. When I graduated in 1964 from high school, that was the year LSU first allowed blacks. That was the first year that blacks were able to attend LSU. Now they say that no, it's 54. That's not true, because in 54 there was a young man whose father was a lawyer, an attorney, and his father sued the state to get his son into the university and his son was tortured so much he didn't last a semester. So I don't count that young man. That young man comes back and he's not a young man anymore. He's about my age. But he comes back and talk about the experience. He's actually older than me. Comes back and talk about the experience that he had when he was at LSU. The teachers and the students wouldn't even talk to him. I think most of you have heard about the history of the South and the integration of the colleges in the South. Uh, you've heard some negative stories about Arkansas and Alabama. You didn't hear anything about LSU, so at least LSU integrated you know, fairly easily without all the hoopla that went on at these other Southern states. So I can say that positively about LSU. But they selected six African-Americans in 1964 to attend uh, LSU. 
So obviously I couldn't attend LSU because I wasn't one of the six that was selected. And I had a full scholarship to Southern, so that's where I would have gone anyway because I come from a very poor family, and that's where if, if uh, Southern was going to give me a full scholarship, that's where I would have gone. But I'm going to say now that LSU is now the number one producer of African-American PhDs in chemistry, number one in the country. That was one year where 20% of the African-Americans receiving PhDs in chemistry came from LSU, which is amazing. So the chemical and engineering news, our trade magazine, got a hold of that, and they wrote an article in 2001 wanting to know what is LSU doing right. LSU, largest producer of African-American chemistry PhDs, boosts a model graduate education program. If you look at the statistics here, this is the number of BAs, MA, MS, and PhDs. Here are the PhD degrees at LSU. You notice around 1997, zoom, it's a big increase, and that's mostly because of the PhD production in chemistry. If you look at the preceding years, now even the graduate program, now there were a few blacks, before the first African Americans came in as undergraduates, there were a few blacks allowed at the institution, but mostly, if you, in the 50s, if you applied to LSU to get a PhD or a graduate degree, the state of Louisiana would pay you. Now these are, I'm not making these things up. If you want to look this up, this is history. The state of Louisiana would pay you to go outside of the state to get an advanced degree if you were black. That's to keep the university from being integrated. Okay? So before this time, it's not surprising that you only had one or two. I mean, look at this number, zero and two. So here's one person, and I'll show you who these persons are in a minute. And here are two persons here, and here's one across here. That's got to be the same person, right? Because that person <laughs> took, a, that's about the average time for a PhD, about six years or so, right? And so the first PhDs, Richard Evans, who was 1965 to 1971, got his PhD at LSU. He was chair of the chemistry department at Alabama A&M for a number of years. Mildred Smalley, some of you might know her, just retired from Southern University, received her PhD in 1972. She was one of my teachers at uh, Southern University. And then Don Pryor was the third person. And Don Pryor was one of my contemporaries. He was from Avoyles Parish. He was raised about 15 miles from Bunky, a little town called Mansoor. And Mansoor is where my mother's family come from. If I were, Mansoor is not much smaller than Bunkett, maybe three or 4,000. But if I were to just walk in the streets of Mansoor and shake hands with someone, within five minutes we can establish that we're either related by marriage or by, or, or by blood. Because almost everybody in that town is related to me, everyone that I ever meet. So that's where Don is from. So Don and I knew each other. We're both Catholic. And we used to share, back in those days, even the Catholic Church was segregated. And so we shared a priest. Mansur and Bunky had the same priest. And so this priest would go between those two churches. And so things were pretty dismal in those days. That's from 1965 to 1985. And there were three PhD degrees total in those 20 years. Before that, there were none. Okay, so those are the first three PhDs in chemistry at LSU. It's what it looks like now. Notice that the numbers have graduated from ones and twos to thirties and twenties. Okay? Over the last 10 years, we've averaged more than 30 African Americans working toward PhDs in chemistry. And these are the students that are graduating. I think it was in 2000 where we produced 20% of the PhDs in the country. Okay, and so you want to guess when I first arrived? What year do you think I first arrived at LSU? In 1992. What had happened was, before this time, they had never had more than three African Americans working on PhD at that time. 
at any time in the history of the university. So I came in 1992. They had two African Americans. Four students applied. They told them that there was a new African American professor coming in the, into the university. So all four of those accepted. I came in with 10 graduate students, half of whom were African American. So all of a sudden, you in an apartment that never had more than three at one time, they now have 11. Those 11 were very happy, and they started telling the other students that number grew to 20. And then Ted Greenwood of the Sloan Foundation came to me. I was chair of the apartment right, right then, and he said, Isaiah, if, if you increase those numbers, we will give you $30,000 for every student that you bring in. I said, Ted, I have no idea what's going on, and those numbers are not going to stay there. So about three years later, Ted said, what are the numbers? I said, oh, 30, 32. He said, I thought they weren't going to increase. He said, I said, I thought so too. And that's where that paper was written, where we went back and looked at what happened. So a lot of people give me credit for planning this. It was not a plan. It happened. And we had to go back and figure out what happened and why did it happen. And so selection criteria, GPA, letters of references. The GRE we use, but we do not necessarily focus on just the GRE. Even the, I, I help write the GRE for the Educational Testing Service. And even the ETS will tell you that the GRE alone is not a good predictor of success in graduate school. That's a fact. That's data to support that. In fact, when you get to the higher end where students score real high, sometimes there's an anti-correlation. Very bright students tend not to do as well sometime in graduate school. Uh, personal interview, and those are the key factors that we use in terms of, and, and we apply this criteria now to all of our graduate students. It's not just applied to African Americans, it's applied to all of our graduate students, because you can see where a student who comes from, let's say, the Appalachian Mountains, they might have uh, some uh, deprived education also, and so there might be some consideration for them. So we apply to all of our students, same criteria. Okay? What are the success factors? Mentoring and support, proximity of HBCUs, we're surrounded by historically black colleges, so that makes us successful. Critical mass, faculty collusion, that actually helped us. Because I happened to be chair at the time when all of this was happening, as I indicated, I didn't know what was happening. But two of our faculty members started spreading to the majority of students that Isaiah Warren is denigrating your degree. He's going to make your PhD worthless. And and I, and I was told that I was making it worthless by bringing in these students that are not competent. And I wasn't on, I was on the selection committee, but I wasn't making these decisions. But it was clearly placed on my lap. So what did I do? I called a, a retreat for the entire faculty. And then I brought in a facilitator. And I asked all of the graduate students to come and to entice them to come I offered a barbecue dinner, and we got off campus. We went off campus to a site, and everyone showed up. And I said, let's talk about the problems in an apartment. And I knew what would come up, and this came up. We talked about all of this, and one of my graduate students came to me and said, Dr. Warner, this is an African-American female who was doing very well. She's at Procter & Gamble now, and she's in second tier admin uh, administration at Procter & Gamble doing extremely well. But she said, Dr. Warren, these are our friends talking about us. And I said, and what are you going to do about it? She said, don't worry, we'll take care of this. The African Americans got in the classroom, and they worked their butts off, and they scored at the top of the class, and before you know it, all of this talk stopped. How can you call someone inferior if they're beating your butts in the classroom? You can't continue to, with that talk, and that's what happened. I don't hear any of that anymore. In fact, that faculty member, one of the faculty members who's involved in this, I recently heard him say, our students are really improving. Uh, this apartment is getting better and better. And now he's saying this as the number of African Americans are increasing. I hope he knows what he's saying. But he doesn't uh, spread any of these kinds of rumors. Self-sustained recruiting students. 
actually have positive experience so they go back and tell their other friends. Employability. That was, who was that? I think it was Dow. We interviewed four of our African American students. And they were so impressed with these students, they called Dow and Plaquemine across the river from LSU and said, are you guys recruiting at LSU? And they said, no, you told us not to. Why is that? Well, we, you told us to only recruit the top 10 school. Well, go over to LSU and see what's going on. And all of a sudden, L, uh, Dow started giving us money. They started recruiting at LSU. Procter & Gamble started giving us money. Because, and, I t and I was chair. And I said, you're welcome to come in and recruit, but you're going to recruit all of our students. You're not going to just look at our African Americans. So all of our students have uh, had the access to these recruiters that come in. There are lots of companies that come in and recruit now. There are lots of student companies, there are lots of universities that come in and recruit my undergraduates now. I just came from Ohio State where I was reviewing a program and two of my undergraduates in that program working toward PhDs in engineering. And so once they find a good product, they will go where that product is. Uh, mentoring graduate students, they're excited about their research work. They have positive interaction with students. They have same evaluation criteria as all students. I have to say that sometime. I think to some people that's obvious, but some people it's not obvious. As a matter of fact, I'm a board professor, which is the highest rank of professorship on the LSU campus. That's pretty good for somebody who couldn't attend LSU. I am now the highest ranked professor on LSU's campus. And I didn't just earn that loosely. Yesterday, I had a goal when I started my academic career. I wanted at least 300 publications and graduate 50 PhDs. My secretary just emailed me yesterday and said, you have your 300 publication just been accepted. So I've, I've reached that goal. I now have 48 graduate students that have earned their PhD under me. So I've got two more of those. But I think I'll achieve both of my goals. So I think I have earned the uh, right to be a board professor. And so create diversity in groups. Some of the best groups in the department have a very diverse group. It has to go do with that environment, diversity in the environment. They've taken advantage of programs and opportunities. Now, how are they doing? The reason I put this slide up is because I mentioned a board professor. The board professors meet together, and one of the board professors asked me one day, how are the African Americans doing in your department? Now, first of all, I was taken aback by that question, and then, then I said, well, they're doing like everyone else. Some, some are at the top, some are at the bottom, and some are in the middle. And he said, that, that can't be. I said, yes, it is. And I thought he was going to say, well, are they doing that well? No. What he was saying, how can you call that a successful program if not all of them are performing well? I said, not all majority students perform well. I said, if they're doing as well as the rest of the group, then that's all you can expect them to do. Why should you expect them to do any more? And so I went back and got this data. What is the percentage of African Americans that get PhDs in our department? Well, here are all of the degrees. 58% of our students earn their PhDs. And at first I thought, this is terrible. But I've talked to other people and they said, That's, this is about typical, about 60%. So I, I said, well, let me see what the African Americans are doing. How many of them get their PhDs? Oops. That's all degrees. Where is it? Anyway, I don't know what happened to the what you'll see is that 58% of the African Americans get PhDs, exactly the same. I was surprised at that. I didn't know it would be exactly the same, but it's exactly the same, and that's all you can expect. Otherwise, it would be collusion. So I don't know, maybe that slide shows up somewhere later. Yeah, it's just not there. So, the, oops, I know what I did. I went the wrong way. That's what happened. Okay, 58% here, yeah, here are the African Americans. I was going the wrong way, pushed the wrong slide. So 58% of the African Americans also get their PhDs. I mentioned we were surrounded by HBCUs, okay? 
This is Prairie View, Texas Southern. Up here is Grambling and Southern University in Freeport. We have three universities down here in New Orleans, uh, Southern University of New Orleans, Xavier, and Dillard, and then the Southern University in Baton Rouge, and you have four universities. And here we are in Baton Rouge. So we're surrounded by historically black colleges. So if you have a university that is known to be good for African Americans, naturally we would attract that population because we're not that far away. Here are where our students are coming from now, all over the country. Well, at least in the southeast. Okay. And, uh, and it's beginning to expand, getting students up from Iowa and other places. And so these students are apt, uh, active in campus activities. They're active as campus, in the Center for Academic Success, Sonny McGuire uses them all the time as tutors. So now our students on campus see a diverse population of students touring, active in community charitable activities. For example, I'm diabetic, and our students are very active in, in diabetic uh, march. Uh, I remember one of my students called my wife one day and said, we're going to march for diabetes. Are you going to join us? And she went out and joined them. Uh, active as role models for undergraduates. Tell you an interesting story. How much time do I have? Am I about... I've used up my time, right? <laughs> it's just about over right now. I'm going to tell you a very interesting story. It's very humorous. When I was, I, I was a rotator at NSF, and there were two young men from MIT who had been going into the African-American community, uh, interacting, trying to convince them about the excitement of STEM fields and all of that. And I'm going to describe these. One was stocky like me, but much shorter, maybe five, seven, five, eight. The other was tall and slender, sort of a Mutt and Jeff sort of pair. And I asked them, I said, what's the most common question you ask in the African-American community? And they started laughing. I said, what's so funny? They said, the question you just asked. I said, what's so funny about my question? They said, well, the most common question we're asked is, are you guys twins? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the way African-American students tend to react when they see people that are, well, anybody will see someone different than they are, they, they will tend to look at the characteristics they have in similar as opposed to the characteristics that are similar with them. So now our students see these black students coming into the community and say, you're working on a PhD? You must be a genius. No, you don't have to be a genius to get a PhD. And now we think we have a group of students that are going to come through a pipeline wanting to get PhDs just because they see our students out there in the community. LSU was listed as a hot spot for diversity. I was called by one of my friends from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, who said, wow, I've never seen anyone's name mentioned in one of these things, and they had mentioned my name. I wasn't chair of the department then, but they indicated the chair of the chemistry department, Isaiah Warner, is creating an environment. Again, I told you how it happened. I'm honest about how it happened. It was not me. It just happened by happenstance. We went back and looked at how it happened. But we were listening in U.S. News and World Report as a hot spot for diversity, the whole university, just because of what was happening in chemistry. Here are some of the original 20 students. This is the young, young lady right here who indicated that we're going we're gonna to do something about this. She's small and petite, but she's a very powerful young lady when she makes up her mind. I have another story about her. She actually started at Emory after I left at Emory and transferred to LSU. That's a long story. Sometime I'll tell you that. But I'll, pretty much all of these students have gotten their PhDs now and are doing very well. This young lady is now on the faculty at Southern, her alma mater. Uh, this young man, some of you might know Ted Williams from the College of Worcester. This young man, or used to be from college, Ted passed away about 10 years ago. Um, this young man was a football player at Wooster and hurt his leg and found out he also had a brain. So Ted sent him, <laughs> Ted, Ted sent him to work on his PhD with me. He was one of the best students I've ever had. Just truly a remarkable young man. He was one of the ones who would have come to Emory 
but came to LSU with me. Because he was a football player, he was stopped all the time. What are you doing in the chemistry building? Do you have business here? He didn't look like a chemist, you know. And we have a Nobuche chapter here. These are offers of my Nobuche chapters. This young lady is one of my students from Grambling. She struggled the first year. She is a superstar now. I mean, she is just so incredible. I'm in awe when I talk to her sometime because I'm at the point, and this is how we judge our students. When you're learning more from them than you're teaching them, then, then you're really, I, I am just learning so much from this young lady. I mean, she's working on an entirely new project uh, antimicrobial uh, species that we've, uh, drug that we've created. And it's just exciting to be around her and her talking about our research. I just got an email today from someone who heard her give a talk on our research and they want to come and talk to me about collaborating. And so I'll be glad to answer any questions. I think this is a good point to stop. Yes. We uh, there's a bridge to the doctorate program that NSF puts out, and that is a source we have. But in fact, you know, one of the things that uh, there are a couple of departments will not support minority students unless they have special funds for minority students. And we contend that they should support them like they do any other students. Now, we have a bridge to the doctorate program which fo focuses on uh, minority students, but it's only funding for two years. After that, they have to pick up the funding. And we do that in chemistry. But the other departments say, OK, the bridge to the doctorate money has run out. What do we do now? I say, you support them just like you do other students. And so that's a never-ending problem. There's a lot of fellowships available. Our students. The young lady I just showed you, who I told you is a superstar, she actually has two fellowships, one from Merck and one from NASA. Um, Dr. Warner, uh, my name is Eliseo de Leon. I'm the, uh, I guess, the student body or the graduate senate uh, representative for the material science and engineering program. Yes. And Dr. Ogilvy uh, presented to us a couple of weeks, maybe a month ago, I guess. Uh, citing that one of the issues is uh, marginalization of students, and that's why they don't go on to complete their PhDs. How would you address, or, or what are your thoughts on that? Marginalization in what way? Um, I think basically they don't feel that they are inclusive, or that the program isn't necessarily inclusive, and as a, as a result, um, they, don't, they don't feel that support that you've uh, addressed in this talk. Uh -huh. How can we address? if those are the issues that we're facing here? Well, that, to some extent, that's true. Because one of the things that happens when you have a large cadre of students like we do is they support each other. And so I can recall the young lady I mentioned, Crystal, who said, we'll do something about that. Well, there was a student in another group who failed her general exam. And I, I remember Crystal in the hallway sitting down talking to her and said, look, I know you know this stuff. I've been in class with you. You're just being psyched out. What you've got to do is, and next time she took a general exam, she passed it in flying colors. And in fact, when she uh, did her dissertation defense, I mean, I was on her committee. It was just a completely different person, only because Crystal worked with her and that sort of thing. So all students have a support system. And you have to have some support system to survive graduate school. I mean, I tell students all the time, graduate school is a cyclical process. Sometimes you're on top of the world when your research is going well. Other times you're on the bottom when it's not going well. And you got to keep working hard when you're at the bottom. You got to work hardest at the bottom to get back on top. And that's what I tell students all the time. Now, if you don't have a support system, then there is a problem. And um, there are a number of programs where, where uh, for minority students, whether it's Hispanic or African American, if you don't, they don't have that support system. We've had, we have that built-in support system. So 
Hello, Isaiah. Hi, Malika. A wonderful presentation. I, I think you're far too modest. And the real question is, how did you get those five students at Emory? Um, it, it, it started, it turned out the numbers were beginning to build up at Emory. I mentioned my student who transferred from uh, uh, Emory. Well, I was at a, a Nobuche meeting, and I'm at the desk, and a person said, oh, Dr. Warner. I said, oh, hi. And there was these three young ladies, and the crystal was one of them. And they were whispering in the corner and pointing at me, and I got home, I told my wife, I thought the old boy had, got, had it, because these three pretty young ladies. <laughs> and they came up to me and they said, are you Dr. Warner? I said, yes. They said, we're from Emory, and we need to talk to you. And I've told my colleagues at Emory this, so I haven't held anything behind their back. But they talked about the very negative experience they had at Emory. And so I talked to my colleagues and said, let's, let's bring these young ladies in for an interview. One of my colleagues said, look, why should we take Emory's reject? If they couldn't make it at Emory, we don't want them. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. You bring them in, and if you still feel that way, I will keep my mouth closed. They say, you won't say anything. I will not say anything. We brought them, those students in. The guy who said, rejects, he came to me and said, what the hell's going on at Emory? <laughs> he was so impressed with these students. But you know something? Crystal made it through. The other two students left chemistry. And I think about those two students more than I do about Crystal. Because they thought there was something wrong with them. There was nothing wrong with them extraordinarily bright, extraordinarily bright, and I wonder every day, I won't say every day, maybe every month, I'll think about those two students and wonder what happened to them. Did I answer your question? I forgot what your question was. <laughs> well, clearly, you, you brought four, five students with you, which was more than the four that had previously right. been. Right, Emory had started to build up a group of African-American students mm -hmm. also, and I haven't been back at Emory in a while, but I understand they have a few. I mean, Atlanta's a natural place to attract African-American students. I think we have time for one more question in the back there. Paul. Yes, I think you're being a little bit modest, too, because I think the most important key was that you believed in your students, and that's what they sensed, and that is so important. Can you expound on that for me? Well, I do get students from institutions that I have no ties with, and many students, and I'll say, well, why did you come to LSU? Well, my advisor told me you were here and that I should come to LSU. So there are faculty members who know me and know that I am supportive of all students. And in fact, a lot of people think that I've only graduated minority students. I've graduated more majority students out of my PhD group than, than minority students. I am very supportive of the underdogs. I'm supportive because I was the underdog. I was not supposed to be a board professor at LSU. That's just my background, and that's just the kind of students that I tend to gravitate toward. Okay, if we could all take one more time to thank Dr. Warner this evening.